Keep cell division here. Here's a nice picture of a cell. Okay. The structure of a cell, it's not too hard. I already taught the cell membrane, and inside there's a nucleus. Cell mem membrane is the boundary between the outside and the inside of the cell and the nuke. Contains the chromosomes. The genetic material, which we now know is DNA, right? So DNA is wound up in the chromosomes. The, the term chromosomes came about when they first could view the genetic material of the chromosomes. They didn't know what to call it, but in imaging, it would kind of be all these bright, beautiful colors. It was very chromatic, so they call them chromosomes. But we now know the genetic material is DNA. The space between the nuke and the cell membrane is simply called the cytoplasm, where all the cell organelles are contained. Okay. I'm not gonna teach the organelles Today, maybe by Friday I'll get to it. But I want to teach today our um, the, the life cycle of a cell, which is mostly interphase. Let me get my pointer out. So interphase is the non-dividing phase. I'm not really teaching that today. It's basically the, the life of the cell. There's different phases I'll show you on the next slide. I want to focus on mitosis, the part of the uh, life cycle of the cell where it divides. One cell becomes two. So the whole life cycle, shown here, um, as you can see, interphase is the phase between when a cell divides, interphase. And um, I won't really give you any notes for the growth phase. Um, it's kind of like whatever the cell does program to do. If it's a muscle cell, it'll be a muscle cell. It, it'll do that. If it's a cell that's supposed to divide, okay, so some cell types don't divide, right? For example, neurons don't divide. That's why if you have a stroke or if you have a spinal cord injury, you lose that function permanently if the cells are damaged. But like cells like epithelial cells, they divide quite well. And so there's these Later phases of interphase where the cell does make preparations before cell division. There's the S phase and there's the G2 phase. Let's talk about the, the S phase of interphase. Um, that is where you have DNA replication. The details of which I'll teach in another lecture. For today, let's just focus on the chromosomes. If you don't know, your inheritance, well, everyone knows this, your inheritance your genetic inheritance is from your mom and from your dad. And it's in the form of 23 pairs of chromosomes. That's what you have in every cell of your body. 23 pairs of homologous chromosomes. The reason why I say 23 pairs and not 46, I could say 46, but I like you to think of it as pairs because you got one half of the set from mom and one half of the set from dad. So if I were to draw, say, one pair of chromosomes, um, I don't know, let's draw as a, as a bar, red bar, and another one, different color. Same chromosome, just different color. To illustrate, that's one pair. I'm not going to draw all 23 pairs, but. That's one pair. And of the pair, let's say that one came from, from your mom, maternal, and the red one came from your dad. So that's it. That's what one pair looks like before replication. Now, this is, these are homologs because, well, they're from different people, your mom and your dad, but they're homologous to each other. You know, if you kind of like look at you know, any, any species, like let's say that location, 
there for your dad in this same location here for your mom. That, that locus, as it's called. Uh, let's say that's the gene for hair color. And your dad has straight brown hair. Okay, but let's say your mom has red curly hair. Well, it doesn't matter, but in both um, chromosomes at the same location, you have the same gene that expresses the same trait. That's what homologous means. I mean, it's not the same gene, is it? It's just the one from your dad, the one from your mom for the same trait. That's what homologous means. The one from your mom, the one from your dad. Now. When you replicate, you double that. So you had this one before, and then maybe it replicates, and now you got something that's like that. Now there's, now there's like two of them. And then the one from your mom, you had one, and it replicated. Now there's two. So those are still homologous chromosomes that have been replicated. You've doubled it. So these two chromosomes, do you agree that there's two? There's two. Before there was one. Now there's two. And they're attached at the center. This structure is called the, um, the central, central mirror where they're attached, the two chromosomes are attached. There and there, the central mirror. You know, there's even a spot where a microtubule fiber can attach to that central mirror so you can move the chromosomes around for cell division. And that little spot, let me try to like highlight a little edge here, a different color. The spot where a microtubule attaches is called the kinetic core. Think of it as part of the central mirror. Kinetic core. And you have one pair of chromosomes that have replicated. And again, this to that are homologous chromosomes. X, S, M, S is my shorthand for chromosomes because they look like X's. Um, well, anyways, the replicated chromosomes, say for example, uh, that one to that one, these are exact copies. They're not homologs. They're just literal cut and paste copies. Okay? Uh, and you call those sister chromatids, the ones that are kind of attached at the hip, right? sister chromatids. So it's just the terms, okay? Just don't get confused because there's all these terms. But uh, any, any questions on the terms? Homologous chromosomes, sister chromatids. This is all happening in the S phase. You just replicate the DNA. And you ask yourself, why? Well, if one cell is going to become two, and each of the daughter cells needs to have exactly what the mother cell had, you have to replicate everything, not just the DNA. You have to double the cytoplasm, too. Okay. So you want double the DNA so that each cell, after it divides, will have the proper amount of genetic material. I'm right, moving on to uh, G2 of interface.
still, still on interphase, G2. Let's remember what happens. Growth and final preparations for division. Okay, so what I want you to know, you're just doubling everything else. All the organelles and the cytoplasm, that all doubles and replicates because that'll be divided equally too. Um, so I'll just say double cytoplasm. In particular, you double the centrioles. Okay, um, so let me. See. I'm right back to double the um, centrosomes. Centrosomes. Um, let, let me draw a, a centrosome. I'll show it to you on here. It's these little things right there inside the cell. Okay, they're very important for cell division. I always look for them. Well, so say you have a, a cell, it's getting ready to divide. Here's the nucleus. One centrosome is like a, okay, I'm gonna draw that little structure. It's composed of microtubules and it's called a centriole. It's a part of the centrosome. There's like two of them and they're like at 90 degree angles to each other. And then coming out of it, like these, rays of sunshine are microtubules, the rays of sunshine. They're called astral rays because they look like little rays of sunshine. The whole thing is a centrosome, this, this whole thing here. And there's one, I'm saying they double. So when a cell is getting ready to divide, and it's like late, late interface, you'll see two of them, and they'll be close together. So I'll draw another one. Okay, so that's what I want you to know for G2. Look for two centrosomes, basically. So let's move on. Now let's talk, talk about the division part. And, um, Mitotic phase, that's where the chromosomes, the DNA, they've duplicated and are divided equally between the two daughter cells. And those are the different phases of cell division I think you should be able to identify. And I'll give you a chance to do that in lab today. And there's some things I uh, think you should note. Let me find my table here that I can tell students the different things to keep track of. And you have uh, wonderful pictures to look at in your book, too. This picture is a centrosome, uh, or centrosome matrix, as it's called. Very important for cell division. There's one, but remember there's two after they double. And you have nice figures that look like this. Um, that show all the different phases you should be able to identify in lab today. And it starts with interphase. So let's look at these blow by blow. And um, I'll note on the board what you should be studying at home. I would note the name of the phase, of course, uh, late interphase, early interphase, we'll just call it interphase. Um, note what's going on with the chromosomes. What do they look like? What are they doing? So I'm going to put a column up here for the table out of this, chromosomes. I would um, take note of the, the nucleus, the nuclear envelope, because at some point it disintegrates. Nucleus.
you put your envelope. Uh, I'll take note of what's called um, the spindle apparatus, which involves the two centrosomes. What's going on with that? Yeah, that's enough. Okay, so in this phase, um, interphase before cell division, look at the chromosomes. When you um, get ready to move, for example, you put all your belongings in a box, right? You pack them up. You wrap them with the bubble wrap. You get paper, you, you get packing tape, you take care of your things before you throw them in the moving truck, right? And you don't even throw them in the moving truck. You place the boxes carefully in the moving truck, or maybe you are the movers. And the same thing with DNA. You have to package the DNA in a way so when it gets moved around, the DNA is not damaged. So the, the um, DNA has to condense, and it starts to condense and supercoil um, in this phase. So I'll just put here on the board, DNA condenses. It starts to, okay. The nuclear envelope is still there. I still see it. I'll just say it's intact. It's still there. Now the spindle apparatus, you really don't have it yet. The only thing we notice is that there are two centrosomes. Okay, there's two. So, if you only saw one, you'd be like, oh, well, it's not going to divide. If you see two, it's, you, say, you tell yourself, oh, it's going to divide soon. And let's see what happens next. Um, early prophase. So we've actually entered cell division, okay, officially. Put a line there. Cell division starts now, so I'll put cell division. Basically, they call this early prophase. And in early prophase, the, the DNA, it continues to supercoil, okay, or condense. DNA continues to super coil, so packaging it up. And the um, chromosomes become more visible with the microscope. The nuclear envelope's still there. I still see it in the nuclear envelope. In case you don't know, this, this envelope that's surrounding the chromosomes is what I'm talking about. It's still there. And um, well, what's happening is the two centrosomes, they start to move to opposite ends of this cell that's going to divide. Two centrosomes move to opposite ends of the cell. Yeah, that's that. So we're taking it frame by frame. This is a nice fluid process, but just to kind of like start and stop, start and stop, um, what you need to know in each phase. Okay, now we're in late prophase. Late prophase. And in late prophase, um, I'll just put DNA continues to supercoil, okay? Ditto, just the same thing. The nuclear envelope degenerates, and the illustration shows fragments of the nuclear envelope. Okay, there's fragments. Degenerates, just goes away, because you have to divide the genetic material, the chromosomes. So you have to get rid of the, the envelope that surrounds them. So that way the spindle apparatus can do its job. It can grab onto them. In this part of the cell division process, the, um, 
The microtubules of the spindle apparatus, which you start to see here, okay, it's green on this picture here, and the blue is the chromosomes, right? The microtubules, um, it, it says kinetochore microtubule. It's attaching to the chromosomes at the kinetochore, okay? So it can move them around. So I'm writing microtubules attach to kinetochore. And so this is the first phase where you can see why it's called spindle. You have a question? You put the quotes on that. What does that mean? Are the, the two little lines there? Oh, yeah. I mean, I'm a little lazy. I just, just write this here. <laughs> this means whatever is above it is the same thing. The professors have all these little shortcuts like to take. Maybe I shouldn't do that. DNA continues to supercoil. Any other questions? I'm going to move on. Yeah. The alpha phase, let's say, the G1, S, and G2 yeah. is definitely not part of the No, phase. it's interface, oh. as opposed to where I started putting notes where it said cell division early prophase, just call it mitosis, starting with early prophase. Yeah, we'll just do that. All right, we're well, moving on. Late prophase, metaphase. I'm going to go back to the top of the board here. Coiling is at its max. Chromosomes are most visible at metaphase or anaphase, the next step, because the, the, the coiling is maxed out. It's easy to see with the microscope. Coiled at maximum. So they're uh, good to move around, and the nuclear envelope is completely gone by this point. Gone. And you just see that big spindle in the cell. And what you see is that all of the homologous chromosomes are aligned at the, what's called the metaphase plate, right in the center. Okay, you, just, you line them up and then we're going to divide them. Um, I'll just put chromosomes aligned at the metaphase plate. Not there. Gone. Um, yeah, and it was so you can move the, the chromosomes around to line up that, that way. And again, the purpose of this is cell division. So we've lined them up, so now we can start to separate them. Okay. So that's the next step shown here. It's um, the anaphase part. So the chromosomes um, will basically 
you're separating the sister chromatids. Let's go back to the previous slide. Before, when they're all lined up, they're not separating. But do, remember how like they're like X's? Okay, and that's like the replicated part. But then here, you're separating what's replicated so that each cell doesn't have replicated material. It's just going to get a single. They call them darter chromosomes. So I, I, I named them sister chromatids, if that's true. But the point is, you're just pulling them apart. The nuclear envelope is still gone. And the spindle apparatus, um, I'll just, it, it's doing the pulling. Okay. And I think pulling, I put quotes over pulling. I mean, it's not pulling like you pull on a rope. But do you see how when you pull from that kinetochore, it kind of V's the chromosome? There should be a straight bar. But when you pull from the center, it's kind of like, whoa, you're pulling me. Okay. That way, each daughter cell will get the right amount of DNA. And so you pull it all the way. You pull one half of this set, replicated DNA, all the way to this side and all the way to this side. And you start to pinch the cell off in the middle. And that's the last phase called telophase slash cytokinesis. Telophase slash cytokinesis. In this phase, the chromosomes, they've kind of gotten to their destination. So they can start to uncoil, okay, unpack, so to speak. Chromosomes start to uncoil. And the nuclear envelope, it will start to reform. Okay, they kind of show that to you. It says nuclear envelope forming. I'll just say reforms. Spindle apparatus, it's like it, there's no spindle anymore. It, it, it's done. Okay. Each cell, which will become two cells, there's one centrosome here and one here. So there's no spindle anymore. Okay. It did its job. It divided the DNA. Um, so I'll just say you're just going to have one centrosome per daughter cell. And I don't really have a column for it, but that little pinch in the middle where the cell will divide is called a, a cleavage furrow. And you start to see that. And telophase. This is right before one cell becomes two. You see the cleavage furrow. You're basically dividing the cytoplasm, right, when you pinch off the cell membrane. So I'll just kind of put it as a note here. Cleavage furrow you're pinching the cell off, you're basically accomplishing the division of the cytoplasm. So I'll put cleavage furrow dividing cytoplasm. Divide cytoplasm. Hence the name of this phase, cytokinesis. You're dividing the cytoplasm. All right. So we'll have a lab on uh, mitosis, but um, with the time that remains in lecture, I want to go back to those slides that I started going through last time. But before I do so, are there any questions on? Uh, Mitosis.
Okay. Let's see. Let me know. Get down there. Yeah. Yeah, what's the question? I often sometimes get confused between, let's say, the sister mm -hmm. and, uh, let's say, the, the donor. Does it mean that this final stage, they are now, like, independent? Yes. Once you separate the sister chromatids, it's just a regular chromosome. And once it gets to its daughter cell, it's just a regular chromosome in the cell. Okay. That, that's all it is, yeah. I think um, just the terms tend to confuse students, but they're just chromosomes that were replicated and you separated them. And that's it. Just clear the board here. So when I started going through these slides, I just wanted to teach the cell membrane before I uh, got into the details of membrane transport. So you already have notes on the cell membrane. I even talked about how the cell-to-cell -cell interconnections can happen, and I didn't talk about diffusion yet, so this is where I wanted to pick it up now, um, start to get you ready for Wednesday's lab, which is um, an osmosis lab. So diffusion is molecules freely flowing from an area of high concentration to low concentration, diffusion. molecules move from an area of high concentration to low concentration. illustration of the, the purple tab tablet in the water is an illustration of that. Um, the purple molecules eventually flow out until it's all um, a nice homogeneous solution here. Okay. But in the process of diffusion, you're diffusing out away from the concentrated tablet towards a lower concentration. Now, the reason why I, I taught the cell membrane just prior to this is because in biology, if things are going to diffuse in and out of cells, the cell membrane presents a barrier. So the plasma membrane, the cell membrane, is a barrier to molecules that need to diffuse into the cell. Some molecules can freely pass right through that lipid bilayer called a simple diffusion. But some molecules, I, I say, need help to pass through the lipid bilayer. We call that facilitated diffusion. Because let's remember, this lipid bilayer, this phospholipid bilayer, what I taught you previously, um, there's one layer, a layer facing the side. That hydrophobic zone. Polar molecules can't pass the hydrophobic zone. As a general rule of thumb. So a molecule like you know, like a 
the sodium ion, which has a full positive charge, can't pass the hydrophobic zone. Lipids can pass through. Lipids can pass. So like remember I taught you the, the structure of a steroid hormone, the four interlocking hydrocarbon rings. That, that general structure. They can pass because they're like lipid soluble. They're, they're nonpolar. Lipids which are nonpolar can pass through the hydrophobic zone. Nonpolar. I taught other things in that chemistry lecture, like CO2, the equal sharing of electrons. It's pretty much a nonpolar. CO2 could pass through without any help, just by regular diffusion. Okay, so that's kind of the take home message with this slide. Now, molecules that actually want to diffuse through, um, when I say want to, let's say for example, you have a cell membrane there. This is in, this is out. And let's say you have um, more molecules out than in. More molecules out than in. The, the concentration gradient is such that you want to flow this way from out to in. Okay. However, if it's a sodium molecule, it, it, can't, it can't diffuse past the hydrophobic zone. So it kind of, its diffusion needs to be facilitated by a protein channel or carrier, the purple thing in the picture there. Okay. So if you have some kind of protein channel in the lipid bilayer, say there, let's say the pore of that channel can exactly accommodate the red molecule. Now you can have diffusion because you have this carrier, this pore. Okay, now, now you can have diffusion in. Well, I guess over time things will kind of balance out, but um, you, you would call this form of diffusion where you need help, facilitated diffusion. Bilayer, and I don't want to draw this thing again, but let's pretend you have a lipid molecule, orange. It's a steroid or a lipid. The diffusion gradient, as I've set it up here, is that way. If it's a lipid, it can pass freely, and um, it does. It doesn't need a, a carrier. So just molecules can just freely pass. So if you can just freely pass, they just call that simple diffusion, okay? Versus facilitated. So remember, this is lipid. The general rule in chemistry, I think, is like dissolves like. Okay, so all right. So there's different kinds of diffusion we've de defined two so far. This picture does a good job showing all the varieties of membrane transport in biology. Here's simple diffusion. Okay, they call this carrier mediated facilitated diffusion or channel mediated facilitated diffusion. The, what's the difference? Well, I'll just look at the picture there. 
A carrier, when it binds its um, ligand, the, the protein carrier, it changes its shape in a way that allows entry of the, um, the solute. Okay, so let me write that down. So for facilitated diffusion, carriers, they kind of change shape when they bind their solute. When solute binds. However, in the other kind of facilitated diffusion where it's just a channel mediated, the channel has a pore and it's always open. There's no shape change. It's just filtering based on the size of the pore that's in it. So facilitated diffusion involving channels. The pore is always open. There's no shape change. So I'll just put that. Pore always open. All right, the last one is um, a water pour, and it's osmosis, which is the diffusion of water. Okay, water can diffuse too. Why is it always open? Yeah. It's just the structure of the protein. There are lots of different proteins, and the pore is one where um, it's just all the amino acids, how they fold. There's no gate. There's no shape change. It's just always open. Yeah. I, don't, I don't have an answer as to why. <laughs> it just is. Um, OK, osmosis. I'll just define it simply now, we'll get into it. It's the diffusion of water. Now you have to think about water a little differently than other molecules, don't you? Like that purple tablet example, that, that's kind of easy to see when the purple molecules diffuse in the water. But now you're talking about water, which is the solvent of most things. So the rule I always keep in my head for water is, Water always goes to where the most stuff is. Remember my biology professor, that's what he said, and I always remembered it, and it always helped me. Water goes to where the most stuff is. That's how water diffuses, okay? Um, So there they show a water pour. We talked about aquaporin, right, last time. So let's say you have aquaporin. AQP in the cell membrane. So you have some water molecules, H2O. I'll just draw a few out and in. Let's say you have some solute, red balls. Solute. Maybe it's sodium ions, and I don't know. But something dissolved in the water. Okay, on the on the let's call this in versus out. And the cell membrane is a barrier between the two, the out and the in. So 
So for the red balls, did I draw more on the in or the out? So the concentration of the solute is a little higher in than out. So let's call this five. I won't even put a unit to it, just number five. And maybe this is one. And, um, you know, I don't know if you remember the second law of thermodynamics. The basic idea is order to disorder. The universe doesn't like an ordered state. It doesn't like it. This is order. Five and one, compartmentalized. That's order. And second law of thermodynamics says, hey, we don't like that. We want things to kind of go to disorder and just kind of equal out. So what water will do is, it doesn't like that it's more concentrated in here. So it will go to where the most stuff is to try to balance it out, to dilute this, right? Yeah, well, if you don't understand that, just remember this, okay? Where's the most stuff? Here. So this will diffuse in. Okay, water will diffuse in to try to balance out the concentrations. So that, that's how, that's the rule for osmosis, the diffusion of water. All right, other rules in membrane transport. Um, active transport, passive transport. You know, pretty much everything we've been talking about here, the facilitated diffusion, the simple diffusion, this osmosis, none of it requires energy expenditure by the cell. Uh, it's all passive. Passive transport, just to define it. So when the molecules are able to be transported without energy expenditure by the cell. Well, that's like ATP. And a lot of times, um, Instructors will illustrate ATP and the adenosine triphosphate. Just the A, P, P, and that last bond between that terminal phosphate carries the most energy. So when you expend energy, you break that bond and energy is released to do work. So what I'm saying is you don't do that. When there's no energy expenditure, you don't need to waste your money. Okay, And we always call ATP that... Um, the currency of the cell, and yeah, this kind of doesn't mean anything. Well, I'm going to take out my wallet. I got cash in it. Would I drive down the street and just throw my money out the window? Of course not. This is valuable to me. That's why it's in my wallet, my back pocket, and no one can have it. Cells are the same way. If they don't want to spend their ATP, they're not going to. Okay? So these passive transport things that I've talked about so far don't require energy expenditure. Uh, so that'll be the simple diffusion and um, any kind of the, um, the facilitated diffusions we talked about and osmosis doesn't require ATP osmosis but there are many times where the, where, where the cell has to do work that requires energy expenditure that's active transport So it's like, this is when the transport, the molecule goes from low to high instead of the natural high to low, okay? Transport molecules. From low to high. In other words, against the concentration gradient. against its concentration
gradient. Uh, pumps do this. Usually in biology books, they, they use the word pump as the protein molecule in the cell membrane that can burn the ATP to do this kind of work. Okay. So let's say you have um, here's the pump, blue molecule. And it's in the cell membrane. So low, high. Let's say that that pump is a carrier for uh, the red molecule. And usually on the surface of these pumps, there's an enzyme that can break down ATP efficiently. And they're called ATP aces usually. An ATP ace. Ace usually means enzyme. The enzyme that breaks down ATP kind of lives on the surface there. So if there's um, ATP available, that enzyme can grab it, I kind of drew this before, and it can break the terminal phosphate, releasing the energy. And that energy, when it's at the moment it's released, it'll grab a red ball and it'll transport it out against the gradient from low to high. And the end result is um, when you break the ATP apart and release the energy, you're left with ADP, not, not tri, but di, ADP plus PI, which is like inorganic phosphate, because you broke the bond, you broke the terminal phosphate off. So um, that's a simple picture of what active transport looks like, moving things from low to high. Let me look at some pictures here. So that's kind of what they show you here in reverse. The ATP is needed to transport um, this molecule which got in there's more out there, but kind of like, boom, move it out. You have to expend ATP. So, that's a simple look at that. There, there are other kinds of um, vesicular, see, there are other kinds of active transport. Vesicular transport is a form of active transport. That's what I want to get out there. This is not vesicular transport. This is moving one molecule with a pump, okay? But let's talk about this transport. Okay, let's go to active transport. Under it, I'm going to put vesicular transport. Which is simply transport in bulk. Just moving a lot of stuff at once. Requires ATP. If you want to move a, a lot of stuff into the cell at once, call it endocytosis. So I'll put that as a bullet point under vesicular transport, endocytosis. It can either be cell eating or cell drinking. So phago and pinocytosis are types of endocytosis. Pinocytosis. Versus phago. Pinocytosis, phagocytosis, types of vesicular transport. Exocytosis, move things in bulk out of the cell.
There's a picture of um, endocytosis. I'll point toward, show that at the top there. Okay. There's, um, it inject, it says, step one says coated pit ingests substrate. And that coated pit, there's a, there's a protein coat. Somehow the proteins kind of make the plasma membrane uh, fold in and vaginate a little bit right there. And it's able to pinch off, and that's the vesicle moving in not just one molecule, many molecules in bulk at once. And then it, get, it becomes uncoated. And when it becomes uncoated, well, depending on what it's supposed to do, it says, well, let's see, it can combine with an endosome. It says uncoated vesicle fuses with a, a sorting vesicle called an endosome. Uh, the fused vesicle may fuse with a lysosome. It may get it out, or it may just, this empty transport vesicle may go here. So there's a lot going on. They're trying to show you everything at once. Okay, let's not get lost in the details. When you bring stuff in, we call it endocytosis, okay? If you eject stuff out, what do you call it? The exo, all right? So that's, that's what that's showing you. Well, let's move on. They have some close-up pictures. Here's a close-up picture of cell eating. So what you can see is that the vesicle contains receptors for the pathogen you're trying to get rid of. Vesicles have receptors to bind ligands. Now, ligand is a very general term, just whatever it is you're binding, it could be anything. I'll have to give you an example. Let's say the cell is a macrophage. These are like your garbage eaters that keep things sterile inside your body. The macrophage is well known to have this very uh, effective receptor called the scavenger receptor. It'll literally scavenge for anything that's a pathogen in your body, like that, garbage, and you eat it. Okay, so the scavenger receptor can identify, identify anything that's non-self pathogen. Bind pathogen. Okay, so that's how you phagocytose the pathogen and break it up. If you want to bring <coughs> fluids in, take a gulp, um, that's penocytosis. Okay, those are tiny vesicles, there's no receptors, the process is um, non specific. So I'll just move on from that. But if you do have a receptor mediated endocytosis, that's where the extracellular substance binds to receptor proteins, enabling the cell to ingest and concentrate specific substances of the protein code. So the difference is um, between this and this. In phagocytosis, it's garbage you want to get rid of. In this kind of receptor media endocytosis, you may want to process these um, solutes a little more. It may not be garbage. You may need it for other purposes. Okay. But they're both forms of vesicular transport, and they're both endocytosis, and they both require a receptor. So I'm going to move away from vesicular transport and talk about primary active transport. <clears throat> Now, active transport is vesicular transport. When they put the word primary in front of it, 
it as opposed to secondary active transport. Okay, so it's kind of a two-step process. You need primary active transport so secondary active transport can work. And the one I want you to know for primary and secondary active transport, I put a couple of examples of molecules that do this. For primary active transport, we're going to study the um, sodium potassium ATP spot. It's a very important molecule for physiology. So you accomplish that, then you get uh, secondary active transport. And we're going to talk about the sodium glucose symporter. So these are both molecules in the cell membrane. We're still talking about membrane transport. But because I have the word active there, they call it active transport, you're going to use ATP and you're going to move molecules against their gradient. So here's a picture of the sodium potassium ATPase pump. We'll look at it blow by blow here. And this is going to be our primary active transporter. Sodium potassium ATPase pump. First step, cytoplasmic uh, sodium binds to the pump protein. Transporter here. Okay, and um, let's see. They have. I don't have yellow. Um, I'll use a couple of colors. Colors. We're moving potassium ions and sodium ions in and out. I'll use red sodium. And the pump is uh, the blue thing in the cell membrane. So the first step is sodium binds. And pay attention to how many. One, two, three. The second step is the binding of the sodium promotes the, the phosphorylation of the protein by ATP. Well, basically you're priming it to use that ATP energy, right? So you see how they draw it like I did? You convert ATP to ADP. That phosphate is stuck there because that'll provide the energy to kind of release it the other side. So I'll put a little P there. It's ATP, and you kind of like break off that terminal P, ADP. Let's move it on. You can now, the phosphorylation causes the protein to change shape that expels the sodium to the outside. Okay, so we've moved from low to high that provides the energy to kind of like move the sodium from low to high.
In exchange, now you're going to take potassium and move it against its gradient. Normally, cells have way more potassium. The green balls, okay, I'm using green for potassium. Not be, uh, I, I, yeah. They use um, also green for potassium. There's more on the inside, less on the outside. Okay. So you're able to load two potassiums at this step. It was three for sodium, but it's two for potassium. The potassium binding triggers the release of the phosphate, and the pump returns to its original conformation. So this binding here releases the inorganic phosphate That allows the two potassiums to pass in the cell. Ultimately, you've exchanged three sodiums, pump them against their gradient, two potassiums, pump them against their gradient, and you expended ATP. Okay? Three sodium ions ejected. Two potassium ions, um, I guess, recaptured. Okay. So this last picture just shows the potassium being released into the cell. All right, so we went through the steps, and I think most of you could follow that, but what's the point? Why is the cell expending its very valuable currency to do this? The point of ejecting the sodium and recapturing the potassium is to kind of keep these gradients as they are. It's like, for potassium, It's high, and we want to keep it that way, and out here it's low, and we want to keep it that way. We want to maintain that gradient, and especially for, uh, for sodium. For sodium, it's high here, and then low here, and we want to keep it that way. You know, cells really like gradients, because if you can establish gradients on the side of a cell, it can do a lot of other work. So for now, let's just put that. The purpose of this is you want to maintain these ionic gradients of sodium and potassium. The, the, the pump accomplishes this. Let me write that down. We want to Maintain ionic gradients of sodium and potassium ions. Because here's the thing I'm going to add more channels to the picture that exist in cells. They're called leak channels. You know, there are a lot of sodium leak channels. So I'll draw red for sodium. They call that a sodium leak channel. And there are potassium leak channels.
potassium leak channel. What leak channels do, they, they allow the transport of sodium and potassium respectively. Just things will just flow down their concentration gradient. Okay. So you know, just think about this. The concentration gradient says that sodium should flow into the cell from high to low. Well, that's where the gradient is established. And leak channels would allow that. Okay. So let's say three sodiums get in. They leak in, just following their concentration gradient. Let's think about this. We, I just told you we want to maintain the ionic gradients. Can you see how the leak would like mess that up? It would. That's why this thing is like, oh, you're coming in, I'm getting you back out. Okay, it's kind of like uh, two guys fishing in a boat. There's a hole in the boat. Water's coming in. So one guy's fishing and says to the other guy, hey, you, you take a bucket and bail out the water. That's like the sodium getting in and you just kind of throw it back out, right? So that's, that's the sodium. Yeah. Now, what about for potassium? How, how's the leak going to be? It's going to leak from high to low. It's going to leak out. And when it leaks out, it's like the pump captures them, re recaptures them, and like gets them back in. Okay, so what the pump is doing, it's um, counteracting the, the passive forces of leak. Write that down. The pump is counteracting passive forces of leak. Okay, so I added that to the picture. You're, you're counteracting leak. Why? Again, you want to maintain the ionic gradient. Let's focus on sodium. this picture here. So I erased this so I can extend that just a little further. I'm just going to draw one last molecule for you to know. And that would be uh, the secondary active transport. So let's take inventory of all of our molecules here because you've got to know them all. We've got the leak channels. This is the sodium potassium ATP ATPase pump. It's acting as our primary active transporter, the one that hydrolyzes ATP. I'm going to put number one you know, sign there. That means primary. So this is secondary. It works with the primary. Let's call this a sodium glucose symporter. Symport means transport two things across the cell membrane in the same direction. Symport, same. And the two molecules that are different, transported together, would be, as an example, sodium and glucose. Okay, so what happens is, 
The secondary active transporter, it uses the gradient established by the primary to transport things into the cell. So this molecule uses the ionic gradient established by the primary active transporter. Established by the primary active transporter to transport other molecules in the cell. Transport other molecules into the cell. So because there's a gradient established for sodium, we'll just talk about that one. You, you can take sodium and just transport it in. Now that energy, is you take advantage of the energy of sodium flowing into the cell and you take something else along with it that the cell wants. For example, glucose. So shown in the picture here. Um, yeah, there, there's sodium and glucose being transported here. Sodium, glucose. Sodium is following its concentration gradient. In, uh, concentration gradient. Glucose is along just for the ride, so to speak. So let's call this glucose. That gets transported in too. Glucose. So, so sodium is following its gradient. Is glucose? Doesn't matter. Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. It doesn't matter. The energy is accounted for by the sodium going down its gradient. And the secondary active transporter can get it in. It has a binding site for it. So that's how these two work in tandem. The primary establishes the gradient and the secondary just uses it. Okay. So let me ask you a question. Does the primary hydrolyze ATP, yes or no? Yes. Does the secondary burn ATP, yes or no? No. The primary does. Right? It spends the energy to establish the gradient. The secondary just uses it. So that's kind of why I like this figure here, just to kind of take a close look at it. This figure on the left just shows the pump. That's what we looked at first. You know, eject the, you know, the three, and then recapture the two, <coughs> sodium to potassium. Here, no ATP required. They show the co-transport by the sim point of glucose and sodium. Here they show them together. Okay. So as you... Um, allow sodium to enter, it's ejected, okay? And as it's ejected, it's gonna go right back in. So the, these shows them right next to each other working together, the primary and the secondary active transporter. <clears throat> Here's a picture from the Marriott textbook, same thing. Um, I have a lot of things drawn here. They have just a couple of things. This is the primary active transporter. Which one's this? It was not primary, so it must be secondary. And the thing to look for, how many things does it transport? Two things. In this case, uh, sodium and glucose, they're transported in. This one is burning the ATP. Um, this one is not. <clears throat> Here's some uh, half sheets. Let's take a moment. Everyone get one of these and answer those questions. Leave a bottle here.
go ahead and talk some about yourselves, answer those three questions for points. I'll check back in just a minute. Okay. We'll check back in here. There was enough time. Okay, primary or secondary? Primary. That's the primary. This molecule is the secondary. Okay. So the terms here are co-transport, counter-transport. Co-transport. Transport the molecules in the same direction. Counter-transport, um, you transport the molecules in opposite directions. So, that having been said, what is A, pro or counter? Uh, counter, because sodium like went one way, and then potassium went the other way. Sodium went out, potassium went in, counter. Well, what was the case for here? Sodium and glucose both went in. Call it co, co-transporter. Okay. Now the last question, 
what is being co-transported, what is being counter-transported. We'll start with that over here. What was being counter-transported? Sodium and potassium. Potassium went in, sodium went out. Over here, what is being co-transported? Sodium and glucose both in the same direction. So that was the answers to those questions.